carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A massive mixed herd of migration animals is grazing across the East African plains. Wildebeest, zebra, topi and Thompson's gazelles. This is CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. Magnificent. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to this another episode of CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. As you can see, we're on the plains of East Africa. There's a jackal that's lurking around because there's a lion that has killed a wildebeest very close by. There's also lots and lots of wildebeest in the area. My name is Tristan on camera. I have got David and we'll be coming to you live today from three locations. Tanzania's Serengeti National Park, Kenya's Masai Mara and South Africa's Sabi Sand. It promises to be an absolutely amazing spectacle. Now, I was saying we've got lions around. There are lions close by. They're lying down at the moment. It's two males, one adult female and two sub-adults that are hidden in the long grass. There's one that is a little bit more visible than the rest, and they are taking a very big nap because they managed to make a kill um, during the course of the night. They have absolutely stripped the carcass clean. There is really nothing left, even for the likes of jackals or vultures. But that means that these guys, I'm pretty sure, are going to have a big nap. The reason why we're staying with them, though, is because the migration herds are slowly, slowly, slowly starting to roll through this area, and they're going to be coming past us at any minute now, and hopefully that will stir the lions. Sometimes what you'll find is even though they're so full like this, they might actually start to wake up and want to start hunting again just out of instinct more than anything else. You can just see them on the horizon there. They're starting to come down as a really nice large group of wildebeest and zebra. Now, over the course of the next hour, we're going to be exploring the migration. And so for those of you that are not too sure about it, here's a little short video of how the migration works. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti southern plains just half an hour, the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded gnu, bleating songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms, verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Jumbo Jumbo everyone and welcome to another part of the Mara and when we talk of migration as you just saw there are so many animals that benefit from the migration and hyenas are some of them. 
a lovely morning and jumbo one more time to all of you my name is david and on camera with me today is bungay bungay how are you and we got a group of hyenas here and this particular group of hyenas here is called the happy zebra clan we follow our characters here and we know their names because every other time we are with them and hyenas got particular territories or what we call dens and they live in those dens and for that reason it's easy for us to know who exactly who they are and talking of predators hyenas are good predators as much as they're big and we'll take you back again to tanzania in serengeti because my friend tristan got smaller predators than mine We do have a smaller predator, so it's a little jackal that has come in to feed off the remains of this wildebeest carcass that the lions had. You can see what I was saying about how stripped it is. These lions must have been very hungry when they caught this because they have absolutely taken off everything. There really is very little left. The thing is, though, is little jackals like this, well, they have small mouths and they can get in between places where the lion's jaws can't and they can then get a few little bits of scraps and meat that is still somewhere on that carcass. But it really has been completely stripped um, and has been taken care of by these lions, that's for sure. It's amazing to see actually how they're able to eat at this time of the year. It's such a time of plenty that often a lot of the predators will catch something like a wildebeest, eat a little bit, and then they'll leave it and they'll move off. But these lions, like I say, must have been very, very hungry. And the presence of two big males like that would have certainly gone a long way to being able to absolutely destroy this carcass and make sure that they made short work of it. What's interesting is that they're actually not even that full. Um, the two males look as though they've eaten but not are overly saturated with meat. The female and the two subadults, well, they are black little round balls. So I wonder if the males didn't catch them here. Tim, you say this is very cool. Well, Tim, it's as cool as it gets to be in the greatest show on earth in the form of the wildebeest migration and to have lions and jackals all in the open plains of East Africa is very, very cool and incredibly spectacular to be a part of. And, and I always feel privileged when you sit out here and you drive around and yesterday afternoon we were talking about it is as you drive through these big sort of grassland areas and you just see animals absolutely everywhere it is an incredible privilege to be able to see it and an even more of a privilege to be able to bring it to all of you around the world and we can discuss it and talk about it it's an incredible thing and an incredible spectacle Right, we're going to see if these lions are going to wake up with their approaching herds. And while we do that, let's send you back across to Steve, who's got the largest bird that is not able to fly. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the swamp area in the Mara Triangle. My name is Steve Falkenbridge. I'm joined by Big James on camera. And what a beautiful day we're having. Over my shoulder here, you can see we've spotted a couple of female ostriches. And, uh, well, we are just following them through the long grass here. And you see the female, very, very sort of plain grayish color. There's no dark black or white, which the male has. And they are exclusively vegetarians. They're very long neck, they're long legs, very, very fast animals. And they are grazers feeding on flower heads, grass, any sort of vegetation that they can strip as well. Look at her, she's having a look for something to eat. Got a bit of grass stuck in her mouth there. They were also known to eat stones to get them into their crop or their gizzard, should I say, which helps them to break down the vegetation. No birds are born or hatched with teeth, so they actually need stones inside sort of the digestive system to assist in breaking down and crushing the vegetative plant material that they are eating. And they are at risk of being hunted by lions, leopards, and cheetah alike. And it sounds as if James this morning has managed to catch up with some lions. Yes, not by me, but by these lions over here. Although at the moment, of course, the salt lick pride, which is what we're looking at now, is not so much looking for bird, but wildebeest. And there are a lot of them there, and a lot of zebra, and a lot of Thompson's gazelles. My name is James Hendry. On camera today, we have got Jean Dre. 
he is showing you two of his fingers. He does in fact have ten fingers, which is nice. We've got one lioness here, and we've got another little cub there. Probably, when I initially saw them, I thought they were about eight weeks old. I think they're a bit older than that now. I think they're probably about ten to twelve weeks or so. This lioness is watching the smorgasbord on the plains in front of her. She can't believe how much food there is there. And I suspect her belly is quite full, otherwise she'd be getting in amongst those herds trying to catch a weak or young one. It really is just quite fantastic to see the amount of food that she has here. It's a little bit like going to an enormous, I suppose, hotel buffet breakfast where there's so much to eat you really don't know what to choose and I'm sure that's how they feel. Please do ask us any questions you'd like to. We'd love to hear from you during the course of this show. You can do that on Twitter using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag WildWonderland. That's hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag WildWonderland and you do that on Twitter. Any questions or comments, we'll be happy to answer anything you might want to ask us about this magnificent migration series or about Africa in general or about this conservation in general, especially in this area. Alrighty, we're not going to move anywhere from here. This lioness is calling. She seems to be trying to draw the rest of the pride towards her. So we'll wait and see what happens while you go across to David and the happy zebras. Well, the hyenas have moved a little bit and we got those uh, adults in the grass and I'm trying to imagine maybe that could be one of the females. Now, for the hyenas, it's normally very difficult to tell males from females, even if you see them out walking, because you have seen males that look like females, females that may look like males, but in general, the females are bigger in size than the males. So there's a whole den here and this particular group of clan of hyenas have anything 30 to 40 hyenas. They move in big groups and you can see one there trying to move around. It is still very early in the morning and a bit chilly and for that reason that's why they could be staying exactly where they are. Now, we got a lot of success when you look at the predators uh, of Africa. And personally, I have always thought that hyenas are more successful than the other predators when it comes to hunting. And let's have a look. The spotted hyena is maligned as a thieving scavenger. These massively intelligent predators are misunderstood. They are cunning, cooperative opportunists and hunters. Built for stamina, they lack the speed of the cheetah or the stealth of the leopard. Their tactics are clever yet brutal. Panicking the herds to single out and exhaust the young, sick and lame. It's a highly effective, energy-efficient and low-risk strategy. Once the prey is selected, there is no mercy from the cohesive clan. Good morning, good morning, and what an epic start to our morning here in the Greater Kruger. You've been learning all about our hunting strategies. Well, look at what we have here drinking right in front of us. We're sitting less than, I would say, 100 meters away from two lionesses on foot. 
This is an absolutely awesome experience. Good morning. My name is Jamie, and behind the camera is Craig. We also have the fantastic Herbie to thank for his amazing animal skills in getting us into the right place at the right time. These lionesses know we're here. They have seen us, but they are comfortable with us. This is the extraordinary thing about big cats. It's very important when you're in a position like this. They've got such good hearing, such a good sense of smell, and actually quite keen eyesight, that if you do encounter them on foot like this, then you don't try to hide away. There's a third one coming. She stopped. She's realized that we're here. So you don't try to hide away where lions are concerned. You also don't overstay your welcome when you are sitting with them like this. There are two males that we saw the tracks of coming behind them. And the males make things more difficult because we know these lions very well. We see them regularly. And we know that they are slightly more skittish when encountered on foot. And they tend to actually run away, which is the last thing that we want. So because we work together as a team, what we're going to do is we're going to call in Trishala. And I'm going to get her to come in a vehicle because while it is easier to find lions on foot, it is always better to see them from a vehicle. All right. So while we wait for our lioness, our third lioness, to come and have a drink, we're going to send you across to James, who has big cats as well, but in a completely different environment. sitting with our lions and they're watching the smorgasbord of the migration. Now interestingly these lions, much like the ones at Juma, have figured out that being close to water is a really killer strategy for catching prey. All of the animals that you can see in the background there must drink. And so they must either go to the rivers or they'll come to water holes like we're sitting at here. And this is a big water hole. It's kind of centrally placed and it's often the strategy of the predators to hang around water and wait and see what comes to drink. And you can see that there are going to be a lot of thirsty animals coming past here at some time today. <laughs> Le, that's a very interesting question. Do lions drool when they watch the herds? Uh, no, they don't. I've never seen them salivate when looking at potential meals. I've seen them salivate at meals, and I've seen them salivate when they're having fights. Cats do quite a lot of salivating when they're fighting or in a territorial battle of some description. That's a tourist vehicle going past everyone. That's how this place maintains itself through very valuable tourist revenue. She's calling. She's just calling the rest of the pride, I think. I think she wants them to come and sit with her on this vantage point. Remember you were watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show? A very special broadcast from three African locations. We're the northerly most location, of course. This is the Masai Mara. Tristan's in the Serengeti, just south of those hills that you can see there. And then way down south. Jamie is sitting on foot, brave lass as she is, with lions. Now you can see this is a mixed herd, which means the migration proper is really in swing. Zebra, you'd expect to see more of them, I would have thought, but they're still here. Mostly wildebeest, of course, and then the topi. Now the topi are not supposed to be part of the migration scene. They are resident here year-round. But I have noticed a vast increase in their numbers over the last few days or so. So I think that there may be some micro-movements of big topi herds during the migration season. Now Steve, oh, that's a lovely shot there. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we didn't see him coming. Let's go and have a closer look at a topi now with Steve, who's just a bit further north of us. Indeed, thank you, James. And this is one of those sort of characteristic scenes that you see in the Mara Serengeti system with a topi male standing on top of a termite mound. 
showing everybody how big he is. Now, the reason they do this is the male topis are very territorial and they define a territory quite small, in fact, and they try and show off their size to uh, interested females and also to show off how big they are to other males. Because like wildebeest, topi are very visually orientated and it's all about size. Male wildebeest will stand as well like that and show each other how big they are to try and avoid confrontation. Um, many, many animals will do things to avoid confrontation. Lions call um, because the booming sounds that they make advertise their presence. And only those males who want to come into the area to fight or challenge will brave the area. But topis don't call. They stand very proud. And if someone thinks they are big enough and strong enough to challenge this male, well, he must come right along. But by standing tall like this, he saves a lot of energy because he avoids confrontation with many would-be challenges that would decide, okay, no, you're a little bit too big for me, sir. I'm rather going to move off somewhere else. At the same time, though, very vigilant, Topi. I find them to be one of the most vigilant of the antelope species. They're always the first ones to spot the lions, always the first ones to see them coming. And uh, a grazer, as you can see, taking a bit of time. He's noticed there's no other topi in the area, so a bit of time to have a little snack. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, talking about being vigilant towards lions, Jamie Patterson on foot is having the absolutely most amazing week with big animals in the wilderness. had an amazing week. We have walked buffalo, we've walked elephant, we've walked leopard, and now we've completed the collection with lions on foot right next to a waterhole. She is in front of one of the lodges. This is where people can come and stay when they go out on safari. So if you see any sign of that, that's why. We've only got the view of one now, which is always slightly concerning. We've lost, I've lost the sight of the other two. They've gone around us. But what's astounding about this is that you'll notice I'm not keeping my voice down. I explained a little bit as to why that is. Uh, this particular pride of lions I've walked many times, and this, they are beautifully relaxed on foot. She's not frightened of us. She's not concerned. The only thing she's doing at the moment is thinking about where the rest of her pride members have gone and whether or not she's going to follow them. Now, I've only seen three lionesses here, and there should, in fact, be eight as part of this pride. It is the Inkahuma pride, I think. It's obviously difficult to tell at this distance, but just guessing on their movements and where they came from. But we don't know where that other male is. Ah, oh, there's another one. Cranky Pangolin wants to know what a safe distance is with lions on foot. Cranky Pangolin, it really depends upon the situation. There's no specified distance. It's all about looking and gauging how the animals are responding to you. We could probably get closer to them if we wanted to. We, we would have to approach sort of at a tangent rather than directly at them or they'd find it quite scary and they might move and we don't want that to happen. You do occasionally bump into lions where you surprise both them and yourself, which does tend to upset them. And let me tell you, there's nothing quite like the sound of a lion growling at you to get your heart rate up in the morning. Fortunately, in this case, we were able to predict where they were going and get ourselves into a good position first. So really, it depends upon the lion, the circumstances, whether or not they have cubs with them. We're going to move out and we're going to let Trishala come in, in the vehicle while we do that. Across all the way to Tristan, who's been very fortunate in that his herds have decided to come back. 
Well, Jamie is having an absolutely stellar week. It's not every day that you will be able to see that many animals on foot. And she's really done a fantastic job. I must be honest, I'm a little bit jealous. Something about walking into animals on foot that gets the blood moving a little bit. And it is a very, very special experience. As you can see, the wildebeest are slowly edging closer towards our line. You can see a long line in the background. Um, they've split a little bit at the moment. And I'm not sure why. There's a kind of grouping that's come to the left of the line and one to the right but where they've split is a little bit far for it to have been the lines that have caused it and so I suspect that maybe there's just some other reason maybe there was some food or something that others wanted to go see wildebeest um, tracking their movements is very tricky because there's no rhyme or reason to where they go or why they do it um, generally obviously rain is, is a huge sort of pool for them but at this stage there's not been any rain in this area overnight and so it wouldn't be that that causes a split in the herd but maybe there was just some sort of thing there that they didn't like maybe a little jackal running around or something like that now james in terms of territory sizes for lion prides in the serengeti do they differ from those in the mara and the sabi sands um, it's interesting because obviously we're in a very small section of the Serengeti. The Serengeti is a massive ecosy ecosystem um, that spans over 14,000 square kilometers. And in that ecosystem is various terrains and habitats. But up here in this northern sector, it seems as though there, while there are a lot of lions, um, we don't actually see that many, not as many as what we've been seeing in the Maasai Mara. Um, and so the, the territories seem to be quite large, um, particularly around the river area, which is very interesting, is that it seems as though there's not a huge density along the river. But up, as you start to move back up into these open plains, so you start to see them here, and then around those rocky outcrops, there's a few different prides that are there. So the prides sort of territory sizes I think is more indicative of the terrain and where exactly the lions are um, but they don't seem abnormally large or abnormally small and um, so very much similar to what we would probably see in South Africa and the Maasai Mara. What's interesting also is obviously my like Kenya is that there's a huge distribution and movement of these animals when the migration is around because as obviously wildebeest move so you'll find their the territories become a little bit more kind of transient um, and a little bit more fluid than what they are when there's no wildebeest beast around. Good. Well, you're going to sit here and wait. I'm hoping that these wildebeest will start to edge a little bit closer and it will stir our lines. And so while we patient, let's send you across to David with the tallest of creatures we have out here. Well, very true. And if we have animals that help us here in Africa to lead us to predators like lions or cheetahs or leopards are the giraffes. Did you hear me, giraffe? I think so. He must have heard me. And he is maybe saying, can you say that again? And this is the Maasai giraffe. We got four different species of giraffes in Africa. The Maasai giraffes are found both in the Serengeti National Park, where Tristan is, and in the Maasai Mara too, and many other parts of East Africa and that's a big huge boy you can tell no doubt it's a male quite majestic remember we are watching CGTN World Wonderland Show and we're coming to you live from the Masimara and should you have any questions or comments please send them through using hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Wonderland Look at how huge he is in comparison to the bush in the background there. And giraffes will live in huts as much as he is alone now. He could be going to join a herd. But not once in a while, we always get males on their own and females will be together with their young ones. Hello there. And giraffe being grominant, you can tell he is chewing some cud. Well, I left my hyenas. I'm also going to leave uh, this uh, giraffe and go look for some other animals. But in the meantime, I think James is on the other side of the Mara and got lions hiding in the grass. We've moved very slightly to get a better view of this little cub. Now, this cub is not, in fact, one of the very young ones in the pride. This one is probably about four or five months old. 
I made a mistake seeing them, just the ears in the grass there. I thought it was smaller than that. It's one of the older cubs. There seemed to be two litters in this pride, the salt pig pride. And quite interestingly, you saw the male yesterday. And he comes from a different area. And I don't think that he has fathered these cubs. He's quite young. But I think it was his coalition partner, Kipuli. Oh, so sweet. Who fathered these little things here. And that's probably why he is the male at here at the moment is not very patient with these cubs. Oh, but they are just the cutest things in the world. Oh, that's beautiful. And you can see how perfectly coloured they are for this environment. That tawny colour is ideal. Now, well, the prides protect the cubs during the migration the same way that they protect them any other time. They make sure that they are in cover when they go off hunting and then the cubs tend to stay still whenever the lionesses are away they'll stay hiding unless it's in an area that they know very well like this pan and when the lionesses are away you'll sometimes find the cubs playing around here but they know little places they can go to be hidden and then they'll stay still and hidden uh, when they go to kills it's very safe when they're traveling with the adults it's very safe because very few animals will take on a pride of lions. A massive clan of hyenas maybe, and certainly hyenas do pose a danger to little cubs, but you'll find that when they're with the adults, there are no dangers at all. This one has been lying in the mud, not very clean, hasn't had its bath. Who's coming to say hello, are you? Isn't that special? <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Let's just wait and see where he goes because he might, it's a she, not a he, she might show us where the rest of the cubs are. See how she disappears so easily into the grass? Wonderful. Something that doesn't disappear easily into the grass, of course, are the great migration herds. They can't hide from anything. Indeed, we are with the migration herds. Well, a little small portion of the migration. That's the scary thing. When you see these long lines of wildebeest, and you realize that that is not even the wildebeest in its entirety. It's quite amazing. But we are a little bit closer to where they are now. They're still milling about at the moment. They haven't really moved too much. And so what we've done is we thought we'd just come and sit with them down here and see if they start moving up towards the lions and maybe we'll get lucky and the lions will wake up a little bit later. But for those of you who've just joined us, my name is Tristan and it is a very, very warm welcome to Tanzania. Tanzania is looking absolutely beautiful this morning. We've got beautiful green grass, nice blue, blue skies. Um, and lots and lots of wildebeest, which is absolutely wonderful for our day. Now, to the right of the wildebeest at the moment, there's actually some warthogs that are also in amongst this. It's the thing about the migration is that there's so much focus on the wildebeest, but there's actually so many things that move around within the herds. And it's a clever thing to do because if you want security, then it's a good idea to have millions of eyes that are around and that can spot things like lions and cheetah and all the other things that are out here. And so these warthogs grazing in amongst the wildebeest is a pretty clever idea. It, it makes it much easier for them to feel a lot safer because if those lions were to get up, um, the, the, obviously the wildebeest would spot them and cause that uh, alarm call to happen and you'd find that these warthogs would then be able to get away. And funny enough, when the migration herds are not in this area, the lions will hunt these warthogs a lot. In fact, it becomes one of their favorite prey items, particularly for the small prides. They'll go after a lot of warthogs when the grass gets long. It's much easier for them to be able to get quite close and the warthogs don't know that they're there. So it's an important food source for them when the herds are not here. But isn't that just magnificent to see them all just wading through this grass? And you'll find that this long grass like this, in about a week's time, if the herds really spend a lot of time here, will be completely done. Right, now it sounds like there's something exciting happening in South Africa, so let's quickly send you down to Trish.
Good morning, everyone. This is so exciting. Now, there you see an Inkahuma lioness, and the Inkahumas are the pride that we have here on the Juma in the Kruger area of South Africa. That's where we are right now. And there's Buffalo right here drinking. My name is Trishala with Seb on camera, and there's so much happening. All I want to do is show you. Now, lions do hunt buffalo, and Inkahumas especially, they love a good buffalo. So let's have a look how this unfolds. Oh, just excuse our antenna and aerial there. The buffalo are getting very, very annoyed with these two lionesses that are about. And we don't want to move it too much. We don't want to disturb whatever would happen. Look at that. Look at that. These are huge animals. And you can see they've got some youngsters amongst the herd as well and they want to protect them as best that they can. And they've actually managed to chase these two lionesses off, but the lionesses know that these buffalo are around, and I think it'll only be a matter of time before they come back with a better plan. Yeah, these buffalo are having a drink. You can see how much dust they've kicked up. Bamford, you'd like to know how old the lioness in the bush is. That lioness looked like one. Oh, there she is, there she is again. Oh, but we can hardly see her. They're chasing her. Oh, my goodness. Guys, this is amazing. I'm just... I'm just wanting to see what will happen. I'll get to your question in a bit, Bamford. I promise. It's just such an exciting thing to see these buffalo chase. I'm surprised they're not more nervous. I'm just trying to keep an eye out for where those lionesses are. And in fact, there's a two male lions around as well. They're not far from here, so it's only a matter of time until they come along as well. Said there's a few youngsters here and we don't want to. Oh gosh, what could happen? They're still staring there. And Nancy, you say that that's so close. It certainly was close. Now getting back to the ages of these lions, they're quite a variety. Some of them, like the original lioness, was born in 2012. And I'm not sure who we had amongst the bushes. There was one of the older lionesses as well. And she was born in about 2008, 2009. I'm speaking, of course, of the oldest female. And that oldest female has died. So you're looking at about 2012. Listen to them. So they're very close by, and little do these buffalo know that the males are close by too. And often, they will need the males to help them get that takedown for a huge animal like this. But they are very apt hunters. They're amazing at taking down prey. And it hasn't just been now, but in the past, they've been excellent at it too. So let's learn a little bit about them. There is a powerful, tawny presence in the woodlands of Juma, the Unkahuma pride. Four magnificent lionesses striking terror into predator and prey alike. Together, they nurture the next generation, expanding the pride and so too its strength. The lionesses have done a superb job guiding the young from playful fluff balls to contributing adults. But the wilderness is harsh and the Unkahumas have had to weather many storms. Drought, disease, death, injury. And 
male coalition takeovers. For two years, the Pride lived under the protection of the three Birmingham boys. But they went missing to the south, and their absence was noted. The three young Avoca males took over the north. The Yunkahuma lionesses weathered that storm too, and mated with the Avokas, and a new bloodline has begun. in quite a difficult position. We have moved away from the lions. We've now looped around towards a herd of buffalo, but there are some that have run down into a drainage line or a river system to the right of us. So I'm just listening very carefully. The lions are probably about 150 meters or so, in, or 200 meters or so in that direction. And what we don't want to find ourselves in is a situation where the lions chase the buffalo straight into us. That would be incredibly inconvenient for all concerned because a buffalo with a lion next to it is a very difficult animal to stop. Now, there's only three lionesses at that waterhole, but there are two male lions not far away from where Trishala is. When they hear this, they are going to come in, I can almost guarantee it, which means that at some point these lions are going to actually properly start hunting the buffalo. And it's a very different hunt. There's some more buffalo over there. It's a very different hunt to something like, for example, an antelope or a zebra. Rather than relying on the element of surprise, the lions try to create panic within the buffalo herd. If the buffalo herd can stay strong and keep a sort of united front, then the lions won't succeed. But if they panic and bolt, that's when the lions come into their own. Now, all around us, I can hear buffalo lowing. And at the moment, all that we really have, I mean, the last few times I've shown you buffalo while we've been on foot, we've been on a termite mound, all that we really have is a valley. So we're going to go and find ourselves a slightly more secure spot. While we do, let us hope that Steve is in a nice, secure spot in the Masai Mara and perhaps has something exciting to tell you. Yes, well, welcome back, everybody. Oh, sorry about that. We had Lioness with two, looks like three, four-month-old cubs on top of a termite mount, busy scanning. My name is Steve, joined once again by James on camera. And obviously, as soon as you came to us, she's gone down the mound. So we're going to come around the corner here and see if maybe we can get to see her. Not sure exactly who she is. Uh, could be from the Olololo Pride. Olololo is named after the mountain range behind us, which is basically translated as snake or serpentine. And there you go. You can see her. Now, she used the termite mound just like the topi did before. So there was a cub just behind her there, just to get some vantage of the grass here, because you can see the grass is really, really long. It's very helpful for her to stalk and get close to any potential prey but it also makes it difficult to see where the prey might be. So lions and cheetahs will often do that, leopards as well out in the Mara system. But look how long that grass is. A leopard would be very hard to spot here. But she does definitely look like she's hungry. We were looking in the area she's in now earlier. We found some tracks, but we don't really do too much tracking in the Mara. So she's going to look for some food. Her cubs following closely behind. If only the migration were nearby, she'd probably have a much easier time at catching something to eat. Those lions up north are going to be very, very happy when all of the herds arrive there, and they will do that probably in the next three or four weeks, we think. Maybe if we're really lucky in the next five or so days. You are watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show, and it's wonderful to have you here with us. We're in amongst the herds of the great wildebeest migration 
and you can see there's a huge amount of carnival activity going on over there. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got Jean-Dre Gerden of Cape Town, South Africa. And the other thing I wanted to say while we're looking at this rather spectacular scene is that it's really nice that you're seeing the difference between this and the Kruger. Western Kruger, of course, uh, really is struggling to shake off a long-term drought and that means that at this time of the year animals are concentrating around water and you can see how dry it is in comparison with this verdant paradise that these animals find themselves in. And that of course is because we are almost on the equator. The weather here is very very similar year round. We do have kind of a rainy season and kind of a dryish season but it's nothing like down in the Kruger where you have the extreme dry of the winter and then sometimes the extreme wet of the summer if you're lucky. Here it's pretty consistent and also the rainfall in total here is probably almost double what it is there in the Kruger. And the animals here really enjoy that of course. The other major difference is the soil. The soil here is re relatively recently uh, volcanically active which makes it much more fertile whereas the ones down in Kruger where you're going to go now are much more ancient. There's been uh, eons since the last volcanic activity. Let's go back there now to Trish and the buffalo. Now my buffalo are still looking a little bit nervous, but they're starting to relax or sort of be lulled into a sort of false sense of security here. And it almost seemed as if those lionesses were sort of leading them into that false sense of security because they were very open. They didn't even attempt to kind of hide away. So I wonder, as Jamie mentioned, those two males are close by. Maybe this is their strategy. And they are big time planners and strategizers. And that's how they can be successful, especially when it comes to buffalo hunt. These are large animals. The last thing they want is a horn through them, which could ba basically spell death for any lion that's in the wrong place at the wrong time. So what they're going to try to do is isolate one or two animals, possibly a calf, maybe an adult, or maybe two of them, and that's when they will make their move. Let's listen to them. Ravinda, you say there's so many. There certainly is. In fact, as far as I can see, but I am on a sort of a high area but that whole area is covered by buffalo and there are so many now you could hear the water swooshing as they drink and move about in the water you can also hear them bellowing and you can hear the chip 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 of the red bulled ox peckers even yellow bulled ox peckers that are sitting on them now these birds will often sit on them and then they'll clean up any parasites that are bothering the buffalo. I can only imagine what will unfold here because those lions are so, so close. I'm gonna sit tight right here, but let me send you up to East Africa with Tristan and we'll see how he's doing. see how much easier our lions have it in terms of the fact that they not only have a number of other animals to hunt but also the grass being as long as it is at the moment really does camouflage them very well when they're in the longer grass you can see in the shorter grass much easier to see the male but the female blends in incredibly well and so for hunting purposes it's why the lions like to use these longer grass areas they can really blend in and they can get much closer to the wildebeest and especially with wildebeest they've got to be very careful because if they get too close and spook these herds these herds just run for kilometers and don't stop and the lions will then lose their chance so they need to make sure that they get into the longer grass sections to stay nice and low and that makes life a lot easier 
for them. And you can see that female, she really does blend when she's low down. But as soon as she lifts her head and those black ear patches on the back are visible, it's much easier to see them. Now, we've seen in South Africa that there's two male lions that Jamie was talking about close to those buffalo. And here we have two male lions. And it's very, very important for males to form coalitions if they are to secure a decent territory. Most cats, as your tabby will tell you, are solitary. The African lion is an exception. A pride consists of lionesses and their cubs. Their obvious affection is both amusing and heartwarming. Unlike the Lion King would have you believe, Male lions are not part of the pride. They live in coalitions. Males are not intimately involved in the raising of their cubs. Their role is to protect them, often indirectly. Young males leave home at adolescence. Brothers and cousins roam the wild like unruly teenagers. At around five years old, these marauding males will invade a territory, looking for a pride of their own. This is where things become nasty. The new coalition will kill all cubs under a year old. It's appalling to watch, but serves a purpose for the new dominance. The bereft mothers will come into estrus and the new bosses will then further their own genetic legacy. But once territory is secure, lions can relax with their prides. They prefer not to be bothered by cubs and are not known for their affection to the babies. But once in a while, males overcome their belligerent grumpiness. There is little more delightful than watching tolerant, caring and accepting lion fathers. You are back with us on the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show where this lioness is moving around. She has spotted two warthogs and she is using the cover to try and find or get behind them. And there's two of them there busy grazing. We're not going to try and we're going to actually focus on her because she's coming around on the frontier using all the cover we were talking about before. There she is. Her cubs were following her a moment ago, but we're going to just try and focus on her. Bear in mind, everybody, this is a lion doing its work. Look how it's leopard crawling very low on the ground, just the shoulder blades moving come around the wind is blowing in its favor lions utilize the wind to to get closer to animals obviously the wind blowing can give away their scent and many many animals have got very good keen sense of hearing and sense of smell so as to detect the presence or approach of a predator and she's being very patient and her two cubs that have disappeared in the long grass have been watching her is a very important life lessons. Not only do young lions eventually become big adult males and need to defend and fight for coalitions and territory, they need to learn how to hunt. That is one of the first stages before you can demarcate a territory. You need to be able to do what this lioness is doing right now. And she's about maybe 35, 40 meters from these warthog. She's being very patient. There they are. Now bear in mind, everybody, this is live and this can sometimes be quite dramatic. Warthogs, as well as many other animals, lions catch them, they kill them, and there can quite often be a lot of blood and a lot of noise. So if you are a sensitive viewer and you don't like that sort of thing, maybe look away when she gets a bit closer. But the warthogs have turned their back. Look how she's disappeared in the long grass there. 
she's utilizing what seems to be almost no cover at all. And the wind is still in her favor. You just see the grass blowing gently from left to right. Autogs are grazing on that short grass. I can't see her. James is going to stay on the Warthogs. Oh, there we go, like a wide like that. And, well, she's probably going to see if they come a bit closer. I'm just going to use my binoculars to see if I can see her. Incredible, isn't it, everybody? How easily that lioness can disappear in the long grass. That is what they've evolved to do. Utilize the long grass to get as close as possible. Lions and leopards like to try get within sort of a 15 to 20 yard distance from animals before launching a very, very fast attack over a short distance. Any further than that, and the animals are generally a little bit out of reach. I can't see her. And we still got sight of the warthogs. Now you can imagine walking through this long grass like Jamie's been doing. How would you see the lions there? You need to be very vigilant and very alert. Warthogs in this area make up a huge proportion of the animals or the lions diet in the off season out of the migration. Buffalo as well as giraffe and some topi. But the warthog definitely, they're on the menu for everybody. Cheetah, lion, leopard. There we go, that warthog's walking back towards where she's probably flat in the grass. I hope you're all on the edge of your seat like I am. That warthog is walking directly towards where we last saw her. Watch very closely for a flash of tawny in the long grass. Watching. The one warthog knows something is on. Okay, she is gone a little bit. She's coming from the back, everybody. There she comes. She's chasing them towards the cubs. She's chasing them right towards the cubs. She's going to put on her speed now. Warthogs, unfortunately, are a little bit too quick for a lioness. They knew something was up. They just somehow had that sense. They had that feeling that something was going on. And they got a bit uneasy and they ran in the right direction. Well done, warthogs. That was very, very cool. So everybody, lions, as much as they are supreme predators, they are more unsuccessful than they are successful. They reckon only about 20% of the time. Scara, oh my, indeed. Well, she looks a bit disappointed, but that is part and parcel what happens of being a lion. And here come the cubs to say, well done, mum, that was a good effort. That was a good effort. We're proud of you nonetheless. Oh, how gorgeous is that? Now, those important lessons for the cubs to learn where they could have maybe improved. They watched mum throughout the entire process. Sorry, you might hear an aeroplane. You know, some visitors to the Mara flying in from Nairobi, I'm sure. But that's why prides of lions have evolved. They are much more successful in a pride because the one lioness, there they go, the warthog's off in the background. One lioness can spring the trap and others can be lying up in wait in ambush. And quite often they can chase their food into them. Okay, well, it sounds like lions are on the cards this morning. Trishala is watching some lions trying to ambush buffalo. The lions were on the prowl, but now they flopped down. Now the buffalo are very, very close, so we're hoping that perhaps they sense that they're around. We actually realize that you can't hear them very well from where they are, even though they're fairly close, but just the landscape doesn't allow for them to actually be able to hear them very, very well. But hopefully, they will get up and they will get a meal. That is the most important thing. Now the lionesses may still be around, and. Even though they're not moving right now, they certainly can. Now remember, this is all happening live, which is why it's so exciting. But these two males have flopped down. There's another male hidden amongst the bushes. 
and it's only a matter of time. Patience is the key word here in the bush. The more patient you are, the more successful you are. So perhaps these males are just letting us know that they know the buffalo are there and that they will at some point move off and get a meal for themselves and the pride of the Incohumas that we learned more about. How exciting! Well, hopefully this afternoon when we see you again at 4 p.m. Central African time, we will have a successful hunt on our hands. All so exciting for your very own CGT and Wild Wonderland show that is live. Well, thank you for your questions and your comments, and we look forward to taking you on board later this afternoon.